Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine Podcast Radio. You're about to listen to an episode of Tech Done Different Podcast with Ted Harrington. Do you follow the pack or challenge the status quo? Join Ted as he explores how to succeed by going against conventional wisdom. You'll hear leaders in technology and security tell stories about how they achieve their success by doing things differently. Knowledge is power. Now, more than ever. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Tech Done Different. I'm your host today, Ben Schmerler. With me today is my guest, Debashish Biswas. I hope I pronounced that correctly. That's correct, yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. The uh, CTO at Aware. I really appreciate you joining me today. We had a really good conversation before the recording. For the benefit of the audience who may not have heard of you or Aware, tell me a little about who you are, what you do on, on a day to day basis. Of course. Thanks for having me, Ben. I'm glad to be here. I'm Devashish, as, as you announced quite nicely. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. And I am currently a CTO of Aware which is a collaboration intelligence company. And we can get into more details of that. I've been here for the last, you know, actually six months, just this this week. And it's, it's a great, great company, small CDC startup. And my background has been mostly in security and network infrastructure over the years. And uh, when I say security, it has been the whole full gamut of consumer cybersecurity, identity authentication, malware protection, all the way to cloud, you know, cloud security posture, infrastructure, SD WAN, SD branch for very, very large organizations. So I'm kind of in the security space, you know, dating myself, built the industry's first gigabit firewall late nineties. You know, you know, we may we may frown on this today because you know there was a time when firewalls were only meant for a T1 links, right? You know, things that you protect, you know, the in- enterprise infrastructure from. WAN links, which are really T1, T3, right? So, so you know, and then when you started protecting your internal infrastructure from from malware coming, filtering in and wreaking havoc, at that point of time, you would have to protect, you know, your internal infrastructure and then, you know, came next gen firewall and things like that. So I recently joined where I wanted to get back into infrastructure and en- enterprise infrastructure security and specifically in SaaS, kind of SaaS domain. And Aware has a very interesting solution where they look at threat surface, which is kind of, I feel, has been underserved. And we can get get to talk more about that. And I thought the company has a very compelling solution and quite a few large name brands who use the product today to not only manage their risk, but also for organizational and operational intelligence. What I you have a very diverse background, and when we had our chat, it was kind of hard at first for me to hammer in on what we were going to talk about in our short time together. But I thought you were really passionate about, and what I found most interesting were your thoughts on collaboration, particularly where we stand on it in 2023. Uh, you know, you it's part of the work you do at Aware. You st- you stated to me in our brief chat, it was really some really interesting concepts, concepts that I feel kind of challenge some of the conventional wisdom on the virtual experience, or maybe let people think of it in a different way. You even said something that it was kind of an advancement. When we entered COVID and everybody started working from home and we were forced to use things like Zoom, which we're on right now, and Teams and all these chat programs, that we were advancing human collaboration. Could you Can you speak to that? Because I think a lot of people don't feel that way necessarily. Yeah, yeah. So again, I mean, I think one of the things that happened is, you know, I'm by no means I'm kind of uh, dinging on, you know, actual physical 3D interaction. But I think one of the things that COVID and the and the onslaught of video conferencing and Zooming uh, has brought on us is it actually increased the reach, right? Say, for example, you know, a lot of times we would postpone meeting because we are not in the office, right? Today, I do not hesitate, or at least my team members, my direct staff, they don't hesitate if there is no set meeting and they want to talk about something, they just jump on a Zoom call, right? And this can be replaced with any other, any of the other video conferencing tools. And what it does is it kind of brings the spontaneity. And it, you know, I'm not sure if it's true for everyone, but I'm starting to see that people embrace. It's no longer that, hey, I'll have this structured conversation now. And, you know, let's continue to move the ball along and then we'll meet at some point and then we'll, we will do a handshake, 
you know, I think those were in the early days where, you know, in, I would say 2020, 2021, when people thought that, hey, we're finally ultimately going to go back to office and then we're going to do the big, big heavy lifting. And I think people have come to realization that this is how it's going to be, right? You know, there will be hybrid workforce and it is positive in two ways. I think it's an opportunity for knowledge workers to create, innovate, and contribute in multimedia, right? When I say multimedia, it's not just, you know, either a 3D interaction live conference where to this, you know, these days you will have a cool 25, 30% people still, you know, on video, right? So it's, it's going to be hybrid anyways, but I think people are coming to the realization and I kind of anecdotal stories where, you know, people are even using whiteboards, electronic whiteboards to attach a iPad to scribble ideas that goes on an auxiliary, auxiliary screen and they talk around it. And, you know, whether it's innovation or continue to make incremental progress, I think this is just these set of tools give you an ability to do on-demand communication without waiting for an, without an excuse for meeting later. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of benefits to this too. I mean, I find this very interesting. You know, I guess we're right now we're recording this. It's early 2023. We've been sort of back to quote unquote normal for lack of a better term for what, maybe 12 months, 18 months, if that is a good estimate of it. And when I was coming up in the business world out of college in the mid 2000s, just to date me a little bit, I remember, you know, I, I my boss, he told me, Ben, you got to get the on-site meeting. The on-site meeting is the best thing. If you want to meet with your customer, you want to do it on-site. And sometimes these on-site meetings would be as simple as just talking about what TV shows you like to watch or something like that. But it was the FaceTime that really, really mattered. But I think feel like today, the attitude would be different that the, by default, get the on-site meeting, get the on-site meeting might not be the best approach. It's kind of inefficient. You, you brought up the collaboration thing, which I think is really interesting. In the past, if I wanted to do a proposal, I used to have to carry folders and folders of paper and drop eight different copies in front of every stakeholder at the meeting. And then, well, on page four of this thing, you know, with the virtual collaboration tools, I can just deliver these things digitally. I can make them much easier to see. I can highlight stuff. It just makes things a lot easier. So do you think that people are maybe discovering now that even though they, they like the in-person interaction, that that they can just do more virtually that that creates a, a better experience? That is correct. I, I'm glad you put it that way because I think the expectations as well as the service quality, the ancillary tools, and I'll give an example. I'm not plugging in any product, but there are tools out there which will attach onto your video conference and you will get a transcript, right? You know, there are sales tools. I listen to sales tools when I, I'm not able to be in front of a customer and we are describing a complex, you know, AI scoring algorithm to a customer, and you want to, you are listening to the whole video as well as, you know, sometimes looking, just looking through the transcript, and it's there for you to come back anytime, right? So yes, the feel good thing is there, and it's difficult to always replace it. But when you when you do video with the ancillary tools around it to document what is it that you're talking about today, you can even search on it, right? You can say. Hey, what, what was this thing that I was talking to a critical customer? I had five customer calls last week. You know, there was this anecdotal thing. Which one was it? And you can go search on the transcript. Uh, I'm searching in Slack all the time for references to things I talked with my colleagues about, sometimes little details. Was it this day or that day? And, and small, small stuff like that. The term you used, tell, uh, I, I, you use this term called digital senses. And I thought it was such a neat idea. Do you want to explain this concept? Yeah. So, I, you know, if you look at it, if you just step back, right, if you look at today's enterprises, right, whether small, medium, large, right, there's so much interaction, communication, conversation, and dialogue that's happening in these digital mediums, right, that, that it's actually an opportunity. It's a missed opportunity for customers to understand, you know, either, you know, the sentiment or the mood of the population, right? So if you look at some of the some of the large companies, I mean, we have some companies who are, you know, the who's who of corporate America, and they have huge workforce. And, you know, as you know, that people is key. Human resource for a company is the key resource, key asset. So for them to understand that, hey, I, I took a decision. And what is the impact of the decision, whether it is to business or it is to that particular employee? Because one of the key things is we are, more and more companies are realizing that employee experience really transforms to customer experience. 
EX leads to CX, right? That, that is very, very common. And so customers want to have this sensors or kind of a, understand the DNA that they are, you know, kind of accumulating by hiring people from all over the world, right? Right now, geographical distance is no longer a boundary anywhere, right? I mean, you are hiring from anywhere. There is an awesome talent availability, right? For our work, it's necessary. It has to It has to be that way for the type of work we do. Exactly, exactly, right? So as a result, what's happening is talent, talent is rising up. Geography is no longer a limiting factor. You get the best talent, right? And what's happening is you, the, the sensing that I'm talking about, it's almost like, you know, it's immediate feedback. You don't have to do surveys. Surveys are contrived to some extent, right? I mean, hopefully survey companies are not going to come after me, but I somehow feel there are surveys have their, they have, have, have their role, but you almost want a very ready-made or very quick on-demand read on a decision the management has taken, whether it's a feedback on the CEO or a feedback on senior leadership team or a particular direction, right? And a lot of times employees actually know quite a lot, right? They are close to the, close to the ground, uh, close to the customers, specifically in co- companies where there's a huge frontline workforce, right? Who are very close to customers. They get good reading and you got to pay attention to them. So you sense, right? So these platforms give you an ability to do a much more efficient job because you're able, you have tools to listen to it. Right, right. I mean, there's another element to this too. I mean, everything we're talking about is about efficiency and customer experience. We're talking about these from a very business oriented perspective, you know, how to make the most money and stuff, which I'm sure everybody wants to talk about. That's a great thing. But there's other implications too. How about, you know, we were talking before about things like national security or responsiveness or teams responding to incidents. You know, we might have a situation now where let's say you're a, you know, you're some kind of blue team on a security environment and you're trying to protect your stuff and you need to respond to a threat. Isn't it great to have that kind of collaboration in real time without having to necessarily worry if somebody came to the office that day? Yes. Yes. I mean, I'm glad you brought it up. I mean, some of the things that we were talking about was opportunity and this is really risk management, right? So if you look at it today, right, collaboration is such a, almost like a new platform at large, right? The last 10 years, maybe, right? So if you look at, look at, you know, security posture, people think about, hey, applications being hacked or, you know, my, my own endpoints getting hacked or my email, some malware coming through email, right? Very rarely do people think about, hey, there is a lot of communication, more and more communication happening on collaboration platforms. What is the threat surface of that, right? So if, if when we go talk to our customers, you know, yes, there is worry about it, but there is not a lot of choices. So if you look at security, enterprise security as a whole, whether whether it's your your servers, you know, network resident clients, any endpoints, or just your software, which is running either in data center or cloud, you you know, there are all sort of threats of it, right? You you got to have a mechanism to say, okay, I got this covered, or these two assessment and remediation tools will cover me here, right? These are all kind of posture, right? But if you look at collaboration though, right? We are kind of at the mercy of the collaboration vendor. And imagine all these conversations, whether they're day-to-day conversation or a chat about a particular new feature, right? Sometimes multimedia, right? There can be video, there can be a design or whatever, right? And there are snapshots. They're all actually collected at the collaboration vendor's data repository. Yes, most of them have now pretty sophisticated way to protect that through encryption and all that mechanism, but it's still with them, right? You, you, if, you ha- if you have lax controls and you have a bot in some of these things, there are very well advertised and well-known, well-socialized breakages that we know of recent times where you, know, you have bots in many of these channels which are listening to you, right? So we have scenarios where you know, team members are sharing passwords on a channel, right? And there is a bot on it, which nobody knew there is a bot running on it. The bot captures the password and breaks your this thing. And this is this is a pattern that recently happened, right? These are not implausible scenarios. You're not bringing up things that couldn't happen. I mean, these things probably happen every day. They're happening. Yeah. They're actually happening. Of course. And 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 the thing that one of the things that, you know, again, there are things that, that are, you know, where labs are working on specifically in this kind of, you know, lack of a better word, user entity behavior analysis, right? You know, kind of a dated word, but we are doing it and we're reimagining it and doing it in a different way. So we can actually know if a particular person behaves differently than he usually does, right? So, you know, if you look at the insider threat, 
the insider threat is underserved today. I mean, you know, you know, I mean, you're in the you're an expert in this industry, right? This is really underserved because I think there's this notion that, you know, attack is always coming from outside. You know, attack can be from inside, whether it's uh, really a, an employee who has turned against you, right? Or just a bot, which has been planted or a malware kind of thing. It is very much a reality. And you need to you need to have something to cover that surface, which is a pretty broad surface today. In a world of phishing and social engineering, we could be an inside threat and not even be aware of it. I mean, that it, it happens constantly. These persistent threats that are existing within systems just waiting to exploit whatever they want. So you're right. We do see it a lot. And I wish we didn't see it as much, but it's a reality. And so when it comes to security, the answer is always to be comprehensive and, and layer the, the security on top. I want to pivot back to the productivity thing real quick. So uh, another thing we sort of talked about in our pre-chat that I think the listeners would be interested in is sort of the attitude we have about the information that goes into Slack or Teams or Google Chat or whatever we use. A lot of times, I think people think of this as throwaway information. You know, oh, I was just chit-chatting with Joe about such and such thing. And yeah, we had some good ideas, whatever. But since it was in Slack, it doesn't really exist. It wasn't really a formal conversation. It was just a chit chat. And I, I mean, I, I feel like something is lost there. What would you maybe tell a COO about what they're missing when people have that kind of perspective about the communications that happen within these platforms? Yeah. So so I think, first of all, I want to really address this false notion that you know, it does not exist, actually very much exists. And U.S. courts now mandates that if you have any conversation, not just email, you have to, in a deposition and a disclosure, you have to uh, discover emotion. You have to actually declare that. And more and more companies, in fact, many of our customers are actually using the platform for actually legal hold, e-discovery and things like that. And the whole idea is that if, if a conversation has taken place, it's tangible. It's a, it's a material conversation and it's, it's on you, meaning the company, to make sure that there is a bow around it. And it is somewhere there to be searched and discovered. And it is very much there. You know, there are, I'm sure there are other companies doing similar things where you have to have the ability to do fuzzy search on it, saying, okay, something, you know, because some, sometimes topics are not very structured, discussed in a structured way, but they're tangential and you have to get to it, right? So it is definitely not out there. It is very much in the can of, you know, ju judges and courts reaching out and getting it from you. If you don't have a mechanism of uh, understanding, evaluating, and assessing what is that, you know, part of discussion and conversation around a, a sensitive topic, whether it's in a legal suit or whatever, you have to have the ability to, you know, have that knowledge on the tap to your benefit, right? So I think this is no, no, no longer throwaway stuff. Is very much there for posterity. So yeah, I mean, I, I you can look at it from a a defensive or a productivity position. We have to protect the information that goes in there, but also there's valuable information that we can pull out. Well, I mean, there's not that much more time, but there's a couple more things I I, I really want to get into. I feel like you've really made a good case for why we need to have sort of a different attitude about these collaboration platforms the risks of them, what we can get out of them, so on and so forth. Before we wrap up, though, I do want to get some kind of tips from you. You know, there's probably people listening to this who are who are struggling right now to balance the relationship between on-site work versus virtual work versus collaboration, what's best. What kind of tips would you give these people to sort of navigate this field right now and maybe get rid of their existing biases towards it so that they can get the best possible outcome? Because that's ultimately what we're trying to achieve here. We're not, I don't think most business people care necessarily about where the work happens. They care about making the most profit or having the best outcome. Great, great. I mean, I think it's a, it's a great topic to kind of wrap it up. You know, I it, through the through the whole COVID period, right? One of the things, I'm a big in-person meeting. I was a big in-person meeting person. I was, right? The operative word is was. You know, and obviously I met do, you know, the first year, 2020 to early 2021, I met do with, you know, where things were. I felt like, it felt like we are all kind of trying to be very tactical, right? It's very difficult to do, you know, structured brainstorming, uh, you know, strategic brainstorming on over Zoom. It felt like that, right? And then, you know, I think through the, through this whole transformation or whatever you call it, we, you know, I think people were taught by by the situation how best to take advantage of it and collaboration being just one aspect right it's also how how you plan on having a tactical meeting 
versus a more a meeting to discuss creative stuff, right? Or strategic direction, right? Whether, you know, the whole, you know, motion of going doing that is different, right? So what I did when I went back to office is uh, one of the things I did was I, I made sure that, you know, it's, it's hybrid, you know, did not mandate, you know, a set number of days, it's basically said minimum is two. And if you want to do more, it's fine. And, and where it came from was the fact that, you know, you know, the whole idea was creative stuff, you know, specifically local one-on-ones, if your staff or, you know, folks you want to do one-on-one with, try and do that in person, because that kind of, there are stuff that you discover in person still to this day, you know, you don't discover otherwise, right? And and, and one of the things I did was I said, you know, kind of said, fix the days of the week you're in. So everybody can converge on those days and you increase FaceTime, all right? And, and so that was that was key. And I think more more and more companies are doing that. And I did it early, early 2022. And, and, you know, ultimately, you know, grew the whole people were iffy in the beginning, but they started getting in and do something fun, right? One of the days, do something fun, have lunch together with your team. People, people love that, you know, uh, social, social time. And, and the idea was one of the thing I did, which was very effective was in those days, try the days I'm in the office, try to prioritize in-person meetings. So kind of almost block out your calendar for routine, regular stuff, which is our Zoom. So do give priority on those days to physical in-person meetings. And then you have, you know, three days in the week to do your virtual stuff, right? That was kind of some of the tips I can give that today. Yeah, I think we're all kind of learning still. And I, w- the reason I really wanted to have you on and, and you did a really great job explaining it all today is that this is going to be part of the way moving forward. We have changed. I mean, it's, it's, you can't really put that rabbit back in the hat, so to speak. And so uh, I really appreciate it. Where can people find you if they want to reach out to you? So I'm on LinkedIn and, you know, I'm happy to talk to startups all the time, advise startups, and I'm always curious and excited to help folks build new, newfangled products. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Debashish. I really appreciate you joining me today. And uh, thank you again. Thanks a lot, Ben. Have a great day. Bye. All right. See you later. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Tech Done Different podcast with Ted Harrington. If you learned something new and this conversation made you think, then share ITSPmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.